for the most part, uh, I haven't seen, and I don't think any international agency can say that there has been any country that has developed as a consequence of migration. Even the United Nations would admit that, but they would say that migration is a factor in development. I think at the very least, uh, it may help people survive. Uh, at, and I, I think that's also at the very most. It doesn't really do much more than that. My name is Emmanuel Ness. Uh, I'm a professor of political science at Brooklyn College City University of New York and a visiting professor of sociology at the University of Johannesburg and the uh, Center for Sociological Practice and Research. My main interests uh, are political economy of labor. I focus a lot on the question of migration and its effects particularly on uh, poor people around the world. Um, I'm also interested in the question of organization and how uh, workers can advance themselves through organizing in different ways. Economic imperialism is something that has uh, been in place throughout the last 500 years because countries of the global south now, uh, the imperialist countries had uh, taken much of its land and so forth for the most part and had exploited that land and exploited the natural resources and agriculture uh, for their own benefit. And uh, the idea of independence in the post-World War II era from around 1945 to the 1980s was that political in in independence would bring about economic prosperity and independence and the capacity for countries to decide on their own forms of society. And um, in uh, the last uh, 75 years or so, uh, we have not seen that take place. In fact, countries, for the most part, have become uh, far more uh, dependent on countries of the global north. And by that, I'm referring primarily to North America, the United States, and Western Europe, but a few other OECD countries as well. The relationship between economic imperialism and migration is, is crucial because uh, today, uh, in, the, in the 2010s and 2020s and so forth, uh, the major international financial institutions, along with the major countries of the global north, have decided that the new form of foreign aid would be migration. Uh, so just going back a little bit in time, uh, in the 1940s, there was the idea that countries would be developed as a consequence of foreign direct aid. Uh, and that was picked up by the United States, Western Europe, and so forth in the uh, post-Marshall Plan era. And uh, that was subsequently uh, transformed into a type of uh, financial exchange in which uh, rich countries lent money to poor countries. And that money that was lent to those poor countries uh, turned into debt, uh, what people refer to the debt trap. In the, in, in the last, I would say, since around 1995, uh, the major international development organizations, including the World Bank, the International Monetary Fund, and even to some extent the United Nations, uh, had developed a new policy in which migration would be seen as the new way in which countries that are poor, of Latin America, let's say Central American countries, Guatemala, Honduras, and uh, El Salvador would develop. Um, and so rather than giving money directly to uh, the states or lending money directly to states, uh, what these uh, countries of the North uh, would do is they would establish temporary labor programs. Now, most of those temporary labor programs are ones that are in East Asia and Asia and, and Europe to some extent, in which people are allowed to go to the country for a specified period of time, let's say three years, make money and so forth, and send money back home as remittances. However, those remittances are usually not paid frequently, and even if they are paid, they only barely cover essential necessities. There's a degree of cultural imperialism that exists in this whole dynamic as well because many of the migration scholars come from the West and they like to argue that uh, by coming to the United States, uh, people from Latin America or people from Africa, etc., 
learn the culture of the United States. They learn democracy. They learn um, free markets, capitalism, and so forth. And they're able to bring those cultures, even the cultures of music, et cetera, back home, which benefits those countries at home. And I, I think that's actually a form of cultural imperialism. Uh, well, global migration um, has increased, notwithstanding what the International Organization for Migration might say, in absolute numbers, it has increased uh, significantly over the last 30 to 50 years. And by that I mean, you know, when you take a look at the entire number of migrants in the world, there's about somewhere near around 200 million, and that uh, constitutes a very large share of the global population uh, if you consider their families and extended families that save up money and so forth. In the typical temporary migration program, they are contracted through bilateral agreements. There's no global compact on migration that actually is in effect, even though there's one that had been passed by the United Nations. Uh, no country really abides by it whatsoever. Um, that uh, workers would send money home. But these migration programs do not take into consideration the fact that uh, the migration process is like, as some writers would say, an infrastructure in which you have many different players involved in it. And they include uh, people who are the recruiters uh, of migrants and uh, those people who are involved in transport, uh, people involved in you know, getting visas and uh, uh, finding and identifying employers in the destination countries and so forth. And since migrants are for the most part, only allowed to stay for no more than three years under the current temporary migration programs, uh, many come home indebted. Uh, they're indebted because they have to pay back loans that they borrowed to pay for these various services, brokers, and so forth. Uh, and uh, they don't earn enough. They also have to live for their upkeep, their housing, food, uh, and uh, transportation and so forth. And this is in the best of circumstances. The vast majority of the remittances that are given to uh, migrants go to highly skilled migrants. So we're referring to people who are in the STEM sector of the economy, people who are usually from affluent backgrounds uh, and are the elites or compradors of a specific country and they uh, go back uh, to their countries of origin and have a lot of money. Uh, and, you know, people might say, well, this is a great success story, uh, but it's a success story for them. Uh, if you, you know, consider a country like India, the vast majority of migrants are actually internal migrants, and uh, those people who have the opportunity to go overseas uh, have high levels of training, come from elite backgrounds and so forth, and are allowed to go back and forth between those countries, the United States, European countries, as well as Japan and India, amongst a few other countries. Then you have you know, people from France going to the United States and back and forth. So the close to trillion dollars every year in remittances that uh, is acclaimed as being a very uh, important uh, factor in benefiting societies really goes mainly to rich countries and to rich people not to those countries that are in dire need of um, economic development and even to families who require uh, sustenance. It is absolutely true that in countries like El Salvador, which is a country which uh, remittances come from undocumented workers almost exclusively because most of those workers are either in Mexico or in the United States, so those from the United States are undocumented. Uh, they uh, send that money home and it does contribute to families in a certain way uh, by giving them enough money to buy food, to buy toys, to buy uh, education for their children and so forth. So there is a, a factor there, uh, but you know, that might include something like one third of the population in some respect uh, that depends on those remittances, probably even more. Um, and it contributes to an uh, imbalance within that society because the rest of the population does not have that money that's coming into those homes. Those homes uh, and those families that receive remittances um, end up buying these 
various products that uh, are referred to many political economists as non-tradable goods because it's not anything that's going to develop the country, uh, but it's like buying food products uh, that are for internal consumption, uh, buying construction products that are not for internal, you know, not, are not going to develop the economy in any way. So a family may decide to build a wing on their home to increase the size of the house or buy a television or a computer or something like that. Um, and many of those people who profit are the elites of El Salvador uh, who are involved in the trade of those, those goods and those various non-tradable goods. So you can't actually export any of these products. They're only for import and they're done in a way in which the population, including those people who are families of uh, migrants who are abroad, um, have to pay very dearly for. So the price of inflation goes way up and the price of food, education, housing, et cetera, is skyrocketing there. And that's why I would say the country is undergoing a crisis. I think we would all say that's true, but I would say migration has a lot to do with it. The wealthier countries are the destination states. And if you look at the data, this is right in front of us, uh, our, very, our nose, uh, the data shows that the average uh, destination country in Europe or North America and even East, Northeastern Asia, uh, about 10 to 15 percent of the population, especially North America and Europe, uh, are foreigners uh, who are living there uh, temporarily, but not all temporarily. Some have actually are able to gain status over a period of time. And uh, they um, are highly important to, this is actually a very important argument of the book, they're, they're highly significant to the countries of destination because they provide the vital services that no one else will provide. So if you look at the key sectors of the economies in the destination states, uh, the platform economy, gig economy, uh, care work especially, um, construction and agriculture as well, uh, as well as manufacturing, uh, these workers are working at typically lower, far lower costs than any worker in the developed countries will work. And they are a huge uh, benefit to these economies in which you have a demographic decline, generally speaking, where populations are uh, declining and there is a need for care workers and so forth. Um, you know, one of the other arguments of the book is that um, the destination states also benefit through uh, the migration of people to the global south, other countries of the global south, like Malaysia would be one of the cases uh, where you have a growing economy of manufacturing, which is uh, very greatly integrated into the global supply chain. The Gulf uh, Cooperation Council, the Middle East as well, uh, where workers uh, go and uh, are treated very badly for the most part. When you're an employer, uh, the whole idea is to extract as much value from the worker as possible. So you want to prevent downtime as much as possible as well. In this case, uh, you want to ensure that the worker is employed at all times and working 60, 72 hours a week. So if that worker is no longer needed at one employer, uh, that worker might be sent to another employer. And by virtue of being sent to that second employer, that person becomes undocumented. That worker is sent to the second employer because that second employer has a need for labor. So in, in all workplaces, there's always downtime. In this case, migrant workers are exploited because they don't uh, have the opportunity to have any downtime whatsoever and um, also because they have to pay for virtually everything that they uh, need to live. So it's not really a great story for most migrant workers. Of course, again, you know, there are some migrant workers that do benefit and may be more entrepreneurial. Uh, there are always exceptions to the rule, as Max Weber would say. But for the most part, uh, I haven't seen, and I don't think any international agency can say that there has been any country that has developed as a consequence of migration. Even the United Nations would admit that, but they would say that migration is a factor in development. I think at the very least, uh, it may 
help people survive. Uh, at, and I, I think that's also at the very most. It doesn't really do much more than that, except for the very wealthy. Being undocumented is always an advantage to the employer because the employer can always threaten the worker with uh, identification to the government, uh, which uh, will trigger uh, in the United States uh, social security numbers, etc. Uh, it will trigger the uh, government agencies, ICE in the United States, uh, to uh, raid and deport various facilities. So employers can use any effort to organize, any effort to improve conditions uh, by just simply identifying people as undocumented. And that's not just the case in the United States, but it's in the case, it's also true of many other countries that are destination states. For those people who want to migrate, uh, the best way to address their concerns is to pass a United Nations uh, initiative called the Global Compact on Migration, which would allow people to move far more free, freely between countries. So rather than having just bilateral agreements uh, between various countries, you'd have an international system that would allow people to go to places, for the most part, where they would be most useful and where they would probably be able to thrive to a greater extent. Migration is something that humanity, is part of humanity. Uh, people move from one place to the other uh, and that will continue for the years to come. But there, the key argument of this book is that there is a huge disparity in terms of those people who are mobile from the north and those people who are mobile in the south. Those people in the north, the rich countries, are mobile, they go on vacation, they go on various trips, exploration, etc. Those people in the South go to work and they can only go for a short period of time. If they don't go for a short period of time, they're rendered undocumented and are deported uh, and treated uh, very badly in that process. Uh, I would argue that uh, people probably should be able to move anywhere they want on the basis of uh, their interests and willingness to go to various different places, uh, their skills. But people should also have the right to stay home. That was an argument put forward by David Bacon a number of years ago. Uh, and that in most of those people who migrate don't have the right to stay home. They don't want to leave their families necessarily. I've seen so many people who end up in squatter communities in uh, undocumented uh, locations, uh, which uh, they are highly exploited by uh, police forces, by migrant agents, and so forth. And uh, money is extorted from them as a consequence of uh, the fact that they're there without papers. And it's not that they've necessarily, places all over the world, that they've necessarily entered the country without uh, documents, but they've overstayed visas. And that's another way. Uh, the main reason to write this book is to demonstrate that the migration regime that exists today is one that is highly exploitative and that it is necessary to confront the, those people who have the platform, uh, which would be the World Bank, International Monetary Fund, Global North countries and so forth, to talk about how great migration is when they themselves are in some ways complicit in the exploitation of migrants. For instance, um, yeah, they talk about you know reducing the cost of remittances to home countries, which is about 6% of the amount that is remitted. Uh, and that, um, you know, as a whole, I think then that is the main, one of the main points of the book, that migration is not a development policy and that we really need to advance a new development policy that, you know, comes from the global south, that comes from the countries that people uh, leave as well as also allow people to leave their countries uh, freely uh, to advance themselves or to pursue life as most people in the global north have that opportunity.